the individuals. So we can look real quickly at sources of variation. Remember, factors that are necessary for natural selection. There has to be variation in those genetic characters. So, in other words, there have to be multiple alleles. Where do they come from? Mutation. We talked about this. Some mutations are good. In fact, that's what evolution is kind of dependent on. Mutations that lead to these individuals being able to survive to get food, to do whatever they do, and then to reproduce better than their brethren. Okay? So that makes mutation one of the sources. Then there's independent assortment in meiosis. So two of these are related to sexual reproduction. Just right, well, in meiosis, that part of, of sexual reproduction. So remember, we talked about the fact that with our 23 pairs of chromosomes, it is not very likely that all 23 from mom end up in one secondary oocyte and the other one end up in the polar body. There's independent assortment. And crossing over as well leads to more variation. So crossing over is a very good thing in that regard. Of course, just sexual reproduction itself. Um, I wanted... <laughs> This is my genetic son and his second wife. And look at these two people that look alike. That's me. That is me. You may not have seen a picture of me. And that's my mom. And these are two and then three of my genetic grandchildren. I have eight total, but four of them are genetic. In fact, this is all of them. And the thing is, there's a lot of variation. These two boys here, the two older boys, are full siblings. And one of them looks Norwegian. And the other one, you can see that there that he's got uh, he's part Mexican. He's a well and they're both they're both a quarter Mexican, but look at the variation. These two boys, they're full siblings, and they look alike, so he calls him his mini me. And uh, in fact if you look at their mom you see where they get their looks from their mom. But, uh, yeah, these kids, these are four brothers. Two full sibs, two full sibs. So, um, yeah, just showing, again, some uh, variation due to uh, sexual reproduction. Gene flow. So some individual from another population gets blown into or floats on a piece of wood across the river or whatever is separating the two populations and maybe you know it's like woohoo that that one that's tan is sure is sexy let's breed with him or something like that so that brings in new alleles now I also was asked about this whole thing with directional stabilizing and disruptive or uh, what it was it's not just disruptive diversifying is the other word uh, selection so there are patterns so stabilizing is a selection for the mean and it's the one in the middle here okay it's against the ends of the bell curve so something is going on and the individuals we're talking continuous variation here right so the smallest and the largest or the narrowest and the widest or whatever you're looking at if it's beak width for example or if it's different colors the lightest whoops let me where's the lightest and the darkest whatever it is they're not doing so well there's some reason they're not surviving as well so that those that are in the middle this is over time it's not just one generation like they've uh, shown it there's been a change so that stabilizing means the mean has been favored directional is a shift in the mean so not it's not both ends of the bell curve but maybe just the smallest or maybe just the largest and then it would go this way but over multiple generations we'd see a shift in the mean and for 
diversifying or disruptive, you have your original bell curve, and then look, it's starting to split. There's a selection against the mean. In fact, the Grants, Peter and Amy, have been studying some of Darwin's finches. It's a species of Darwin's finches that this has been happening in. And the interesting thing is over time, most likely much past their lifespans, there could very well be two species of finches where there was once one. So, you know, getting into the macroevolution, which would, would be ever so cool. But, uh, yeah, so this, if, if, they, if these individuals stop reproducing with these individuals, then you could end up with two species. Okay, so that covered those few uh, topics related to natural selection. We need to look at evolution as a whole and the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, or theorem. You could call it the Hardy-Weinberg theorem. And I want you to know this equation. You do not need to solve it, but you need to know the equation. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And you need to have the equals 1 in there. And then you need to know that P represents the dominant allele and Q the recessive allele. And so this equation could be expanded for three alleles, but this, to, just to show what's going on, it's more, a lot of times it's more of a theoretical construct. Um, we're looking at just two alleles. So the dominant allele, the big A, for example, and the recessive. So P and Q. In fact, P plus Q equals one as well. So then P squared would be our homozygous dominant, big A, big A. 2PQ would be our heterozygote, big A, little a. And Q squared would be our homozygous recessive, little a, little a. And if we only have two alleles, that's going to equal one, because these are going to be percentages, and they're going to equal one, or, it well, not percentages, but decimals. So this could be 0.25, 0.5, and 0.25 equals one. In fact, I can tell you just because I do labs in the majors that that also implies that P is 0.5 and Q is 0.5. But anyway, you don't have to solve. You need to know the equation, include the equal one, and know what each of the variables stands for. But there's more. You need to know the assumptions. Now, here's the thing. A population that is in a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium has allele frequencies that do not change over multiple generations. So if they start with 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so 0.5p, 0.5q, at time zero, a thousand generations later, there's still going to be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. In other words, the population, the frequencies of the alleles are not changing, so the population is not evolving. Okay? That's what we're talking about. So, but in order for that population to not change, there can be no mutation. The population size has to be pretty darn large. That's where genetic drift comes in as a mechanism of evolution. The populations have to be isolated. They can't be having a lot of gene flow between different populations because that brings in new alleles, potentially. There has to be sexual reproduction with random mating. I got you. This is a picture of sexual reproduction with random mating. Sea urchins. See, we don't do this, and most species don't. Now, so, sea urchins do this, but not these other things, so their populations are uh, changing, so they are not in a, or their allele frequencies in their populations are changing, so they are not in a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, but they do show true random mating. 
So sea urchins are hanging out in the ocean doing their sea urchin things. The males have the sperm, the females have the eggs. They're just doing sea urchin stuff. And some celestial cue says, drop your gametes and whoosh, gametes are going everywhere. And then which sperm gets with which egg? It's just like all over the place. It is truly random. This, obviously, this is not how we breed. Okay? <laughs> so, or how lions breed. You know, we, we just don't do this. We don't have this random mating. And then, no selection. No natural selection. So, the alleles have to be equally fit. They have to have the same chance of survival and reproduction. So what does this mean? It means that it is not very likely that a population is in a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what that tells us then, that evolution, microevolution, is going on all the time. That populations are changing over time. That allele frequencies are changing if a mutation comes in, if there's gene flow, if uh, having longer legs helps you run away from a predator and the shorter legged ones don't, get, aren't so lucky. Do you see what I mean? That is showing that, in fact, it's, it's support of evolution. Also, and I ask how it's related to genetics, the population geneticist could track allele frequencies. So there are uses. We use it in the classroom too for our majors class. But again, you don't have to solve the equation. They do. So we're getting close to the end of our uh, talking about evolution, our, the lecture on evolution. And I've spent a lot of time on natural selection. And natural selection as a mechanism of evolution. And in fact, when Darwin's uh, theory was published, when even Wallace, as adding to Darwin's theory, um, people were really excited. Wow, there are all these adaptations that are due to these changes. They didn't know what alleles and genes were at the time, but hey, something that's being passed from parents to offspring is helping some individuals to have a better chance at survival and reproduction. Wow, this is super, super cool. Well, not everybody thought it was super cool, but, but you know, some scientists did. But there are other mechanisms of evolution. It's not just natural selection. One of those is genetic drift. So let's just spend a little bit of time on genetic drift so that, again, you've been exposed to another way that evolution can occur. And genetic drift, remember that for the, uh, one of the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is a large population. And I mean really large. Well, genetic drift is when there's not a large population. And what this does is this adds chance. So there had been a large population and boom, now you've got a smaller number of individuals. So what happens as far as allele frequencies? So there are two types of genetic drift. One would be the founder effects and the other would be the population bottleneck. The founder effect, and I don't know how well you can see this, but this is saying there are 20 pink, so they're really light, and 10 red dots. So let's say these are colors of some little organism and this is based on, of course, which alleles they have. All right, so obviously there's more alleles associated with being pink than there are with being red in this large population. Now let's say that a storm comes up and blows a few of those, whatever they are, to another area, and we end up just by chance with only four individuals and by chance three reds. So we really increase the frequencies of the reds here. So now we have 75% are reds and, and just one pink where it was, oops, way different before that. 
And what if they're able to establish a new population? Well, this population is starting with a different allele frequency, so this population is going to have a different allele frequency than this one. So this population has evolved compared to this one. And they're not necessarily different organisms, they just have different allele frequencies. One of the things that could happen, it doesn't always, but could happen, is that that could, if, if being red was a problem, we notice they're more pink over here and being red was a problem, maybe you're more noticeable to a predator, then uh, this population might go extinct because you're already starting out with more red than pink so you know this this could be disaster plus they have to be able to fit into uh, an ecosystem that already has all its nice working parts it's like randomly throwing something else into your car engine it's probably not going to work as well okay so bottlenecks